Hello, I'm Cynthia Brooks from Fire and Glory International Ministries. It's a thrill and a joy to be before you again to talk about the things of God. This is a very uh, important day. This is a time that we can celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we can look at the things that Jesus has done and be so blessed because we know that we're next. He was, he was the first the first among many brethren that would be getting up. He was a, he's the Passover lamb. When they thought at the temple, when the priest stood there and had that lamb ready to be sacrificed, Jesus went first. He became the Passover lamb. We understand even going all the way back to, to Goshen in Egypt. When it took the lamb, the lamb is important. It took the lamb, the, uh, the blood of the lamb to be put on the doorpost to keep, so that the death angel could continue to pass over the homes and the firstborn live. That's, and it also talks about in, in heaven, in Revelation, where there was no one worthy to open up the seals but the lamb, the lamb of God. And so I want you to be excited about this, this, this God you serve. I want you to be excited about Jesus Christ. He has been a blessing in your life and in mine. And there are promises that he has made us. He came to this earth and for three and a half years, his ministry was powerful. He never did the same ministry, the same miracle twice. He never did it twice. Everything he did, he did in style. It was never done twice. But it was Jesus. He loved the lepers. He loved the broken. He loved the lost. He loved the woman with the issue of blood. He loved the woman who was who was at the um the well that, that who was was shamed by everybody else. Nobody wanted to be bothered with her. He touched the ten lepers, healed all of them. One came back and thanked him. He was Jesus, and there was none like him. He picked the men he wanted to follow him. He picked the men, hand picked. The men who were going to follow him. He had women sitting at his feet who learned as well. Mary chose the better gift, but Martha was getting it in the kitchen as well. We love Jesus. We serve Jesus, the true and the living God. The one who, was, who rose from the dead, who went back to heaven so we could come to. How awesome is our God. He paid a hefty price that week when he rode in to Jerusalem from the east, going through Bethany and Bethpage and coming in to the Eastern Gate. And you know, to this day, the Eastern Gate is sealed because they don't want that gate to be open. They think Jesus don't come back. They sealed it. Jesus is not concerned about that, that, that brick that's up there. He don't need, he, he walked through a wall. That's not an issue for him. But when we look at the, the price he paid, he was on a donkey, came into the city, they celebrated him, they laid down this palm branch, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, giving him praise, operating in a place of love and adoration for Jesus, the one who did all kinds of miracles. And once he got inside the city and got to the temple, that's when it all started. He had to start whipping some folk because he said, you would not make my father's house a den of thieves. They were selling at the temple. And from that point on, he began to heal some more. And he was hated. He was so hated by the high priest. He was so hated from the, by the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees. And then they began to allow him to make accusations. These were your religious lawyer, the, the, the ones, the keepers of the law, the religious leaders in, in Jerusalem who accused him of things he didn't do. And as he stood in the praetorium and heard every charge that was coming against him, he said not one word. And then they took him, arrested him, beat him, flogged him, put a crown of thorns on his head, took him and put a cross on him, a heavy cross. He was beaten so bad. How could he carry this cross? But God had a man, he always have a ram in the bush, Simon of Cyrene, who helped carry that cross, that cross up to Golgotha through the Via della Rosa. We sing these songs about the price Jesus paid. But do we think about that price today? Have, have we thought about, really made it personal? What price did Jesus pay for our salvation? And he's, he's looking down at us at any time, any given time now. And he is 
basking in those who know how to worship and praise. Those who love each other, who bless one another, as Jesus demanded us to do. Commanded. That, that was a command, a demand. Love one another as I have loved you. But what are we seeing about this love walk that Jesus said we should have, that he had for his people? He chose 12 ordinary men and made them extraordinary. He chose 12 men and none was lost out of his hands except the one son of perdition. Jesus, Jesus, who raised the dead, who healed the sick, who cast out demons, who loved the unlovable, who touched the sick. Jesus even put the ear back on Malchus, who was going to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he was burned. All of the men abandoned him, except for John and the women. And even on the cross, in all of his suffering, on the cross, he was able to tell the one, um, the one thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. He was able to forgive the whole crowd of people who were jeering against him. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was able yet to call out to Father, why have you forsaken me? Just for a moment, he had to go through that so that we would know what it feels like when we're forsaken. So that we, everything we suffered, he went through in that short time. Sickness, mental turmoil, turmoil everything we, have, we go through, he is familiar with all of our suffering. David said, King David says, that he wanted to purchase this property. That, that became the property, the Temple Mount. He he said he didn't even want to, he he didn't he didn't want this property unless it cost him something. And you know it costs us something, whether we know it or not. Jesus paid the price that we should have paid. Paid. He canceled our reservation in hell. Can we love him? Can we esteem him? Can we obey him? Can we forgive like him? Not just forgive others, but forgive ourselves. Jesus, Yeshua, there's nothing, there's not a name on this planet like his name. When you call his name, he heals, he set free, and he delivers. I want to read John 21, verse 15. So when they came, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus cooked breakfast, breakfast for them on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus came, Jesus said to Simon Peter, my eyes are so bad, but that's okay. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Let me tell you what. I think about this thing right here, right here, when Jesus said to Peter, tend my lambs, feed my sheep. That wasn't just for him at that day. That was for every leader, every pastor that would come behind him, every minister that would come behind Peter. Our job is to feed his sheep and tend his lambs. Let me tell you what that means. That means people are not supposed to be in your church or whatever, whether it's a house church or you're in some sort of building where they're just sitting with nothing to do. Every one of Jesus disciples became apostles except the one, the son of perdition. Every last one of them became apostles. They were with him for three and a half years, followed everything he did, followed his lead, watched him heal, watched him set free, watched him deliver, and they could do the same thing. Nobody was as tough as Peter. But I'm going to tell you this. Jesus have called us 
to reproduce ourselves so that we would cause others to be able to do the same things that we do. If we, It's not just the pastor that can heal. It's not just the, the elder that can heal. It's not just the minister that can heal. The lay people can heal too, what we call lay people. These people can heal too. They can do more than just sit and listen. Yes, the church is set up in a way that God has it set up so that the people can be encouraged and that the people can, can, can grow. But that's the whole point that they can be encouraged and that they can grow until we all come to the unity of the faith. It's not so that they can sit there and just hear it, be spoon-fed, hear a word, being spoon-fed, hear a word and being spoon-fed and go home and do nothing until they come back. They are supposed to be powerful because they have the Holy Spirit and he comes with gifts. Every last one of us have gifts from the Holy Spirit. And we should be out there making a difference to the world. Loving people, blessing people, setting people free who need to be free. There are so many people that, that are going through this place of hopelessness right now. And we see it all the time. We're constantly hearing about people committing suicide. We're constantly hearing of people who are wanting to die because they don't have hope. We have the answer. We have the hope. Can we step into their shoes? And show them the way. Can we take them by the hand and pull them out of darkness into this marvelous light? What can we do? Tend to the people. Take care of them. Show them how to walk like this. The Holy Spirit stands around us. This is the way to walk in it. We need to do that also with people. Not just treat them like, well, you know, you're just a pew sitter. You're not much. Pay and pray. No, that's not, what we, that's not what we're called to do. That's not what we're to do. We are to equip them to do what we do. We're to equip them to do ministry. We're to equip them to set the, set the captives free. And their sphere, whatever their sphere is, that they are having place in a territory, or whatever the sphere of, of influence that they have, it may simply be their home. But they had people in the house with them. It may just be within their family. It may just be within, you know, their community, but they should be able to make a difference because they have been trained to make a difference. Tend my sheep. Tend my lambs. Feed my sheep. Verse 17. He said to him the third time, you know, three times a deal. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He's asking you the same thing. Do you love him? Or do you love your comfort zone? It is uncomfortable to go out there and minister the gospel to people. It's uncomfortable to many people. I always admire those that have a little bull horn, horn and get on the corners and begin to, to, to preach the gospel. Those who, who you know, come out of their comfort zone to make people know that Jesus is the answer. But you know what? He's asking you, do you love me? And this is what he said. Peter was grieved. God, why do you keep asking me that? He said he was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know all things. You know that, that I love you. And then Jesus said to him, feed my Sheep, can you hear the Lord saying that to you? Feed his sheep. Everybody's not necessarily assigned to you, but you should be telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ. He came, he lived, he suffered, he died, he was buried, and he was resurrected. And he became the first fruit among many brethren. Glory to God. Let's make a difference. Let's make a difference in this time. In this time where people are so looking for the answers to life. They are looking for the answers. It's not found in a crack pipe. It's not found with, with, with um, these different drugs that people take. It's not found with heroin. It's not found in an alcohol bottle. It's not found in a strip club. It's not found in a brothel. It's not found in these places. It is found in the word of God, the answers to life and those who carry the treasure 
of God in them. If you have the Holy Spirit that Jesus sent back 50 days after he left here to be in man, to change us, that we, op we will operate out of the spiritual realm, you should be making a difference out here. There are few Christians, when you think about how many people are on the earth, there are people who need answers, and we have the answers. Not to sit back and criticize them or run them down, but to love them, to show them the way. There's a song that said, Lord, I'm available to you. You know, and, and, and how the, your our arms extend to him. We're available. We should be available to him. God takes common people, regular people, and make them extraordinary. Gift them up and send them out for his good and for your good and for his glory. Be about the business of Jesus. Verse 18 said, Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, talking to Peter, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you would stretch out your hands and another would gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Let me tell you something. I, I, I understand that. Anybody who is senior understand that. When we're young, we have energy, we have vigor, we can, you know, we have stamina, we can, our mind is good and you go where you want to go, think where you want to, you know, th th think, you can think real fast, do what you need to do. And when you're older, you got wisdom, you got a lot of wisdom. You can outthink them young ones, a lot of wisdom. Now, you may not understand some of this technology that they have that I, I'm looking at two and three year olds, they get a phone and I don't know how in the world they know how to work a phone, but they do. But, but, but what we don't have as seniors is, is the stamina. We don't have the energy. And so many times they lead you and you say, I don't want to go there, but they'll take you anyway. When you're young, you go where you want to go. But when you're, when you're older, you go where you're led. You know, and we have to understand it's not about us. This has been prophesied. This is what he told Peter. And it goes the same for the rest of us. Peter was going to be led to his death. And, and Jesus was telling him that. But he wasn't focusing all on how you're going to die, Peter. That, that was a new issue to Jesus. What Jesus wanted Peter to focus on was that he was calling him, feed, tend, feed, take care of people. Feed them. Give them the word. Heal their sicknesses, diseases, and deliver them. Peter became so tough, but it was only because he demonstrated what he saw from our beautiful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 19, this he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. He glorified God in his death. You ever think about that? You ever think about some of the trials you go through? You may be glorifying God in the way that you go through it. I mean, you know, all of us could sit back and go like, you know, you put your hands on me and I got you, man. I'm putting my hands back on you. That's the natural response. But what people are looking at, do you act like Jesus in any way? Now, that's a tall order. I'm going to tell you. Jesus said they slap you on one, one cheek, turn the other cheek. Well, we almost saw somebody do that in Hollywood. He didn't turn the, the cheek, but he didn't hit back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, can, can, can most of us be that cool and calm? And somebody slap you and you just stand there? I mean, he had a little slight reflex for a minute, but he, you know, he caught himself. But that's what we need to be doing. Do we have to always say something when someone says something to upset us? Or can we just chill? Can we give it just good a place to chill? I, I, I can do it, but I'm just not going to. I'm going to just back up and I'm going to stand still. I'm going to let God handle this. Can we do that? That's not an easy chore. That's not easy to do. But my, there's no regrets after it either. You have absolutely no regrets because you did the right thing the right way. And he said to him, and when, he, and when he had spoken this, telling him that he would glorify God in his death, he said to him, Follow me. Now, somebody tell you that, 
and they say, follow me. You're like, why? I mean, you know, that's, that, you know, you're a tall order to follow Jesus. And he was, but he knew what he was doing. Peter became so focused on the things of God that not just him, all the rest of them did too. They became so focused, except the one, Judas. The others became so focused on the things of God that nothing in this world was able to turn their head. Can we do that today? You know, can, can, we, can we be so focused on the call of God, on the assignment that is placed before us? Do we know what that assignment is? I challenge you to ask yourself, what, what has God called me to do? Not what he called somebody else. What has he called you to do? What vision have he given you? What dream have he given you to do to advance the kingdom of God? What has he given you? And then ask yourself, have you moved into that direction? Or are you waiting on what? God wants us to be armed and dangerous in his word. Armed and dangerous, ready at any time to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. Not fearful or afraid of what man can say to us or do to us. Jesus feared not. I cannot even imagine when he was standing in the garden of Gethsemane and he saw these Roman soldiers coming down from the temple mount. Coming down to arrest him because they came down at night and they had the, the what do you call them, the flames, the torches coming down. He saw the torches. They could have all ran. He, he wasn't thinking about running. He, he wouldn't even let them touch the other men. He said, here I am. And then the one that kissed him, Judas, he called him a friend. And he even loved, let me tell you, that's love. Now that is love when you know somebody is setting you up and you still say they're a friend. And then Malchus, oh, Malchus, going to light Peter up. Oh, like he, I guess he's going to arrest Jesus. And Peter took his sword and cut his ear off. And Jesus took his ear and put it back on. What love to heal your, the one who's coming to arrest you. What love. You know, he taught us lessons that most of us don't probably never think about walking in. And that's that place called Love and patience, mercy and compassion, forgiveness. Forgiveness is hard. Let me tell you about forgiveness. Jesus told us to forgive seven times 70 in a day. And we are to forgive. There's, there's, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. Well, oh God, you don't know. I can't forgive. You don't know what they did to me. He knows. He knows. But, but here's the thing. When we forgive, we release ourself from this place of bitterness. The last thing you want is to walk in bitterness. That's, that's one of the things Jesus came to set us free from. Bitterness, the root of bitterness, the root of anger, to set us free. Now, that, doesn't, that, that does not mean you're going to fool with everybody that, that you forgive. That doesn't mean we're going to be all buddy and pals now. That don't, it doesn't mean that. It does not mean that. You know, he never called us to, to, to take the abuser under our arm and say, oh, it's all right now, although you'll probably do it to me again. He didn't, he didn't do that to us. But he said, forgive them. You know what he said on the cross again? Forgive them, and I love these words, for they know not what they do. People don't have the foggiest clue what they're doing to the people of God when they act out of character with them. They don't know. The Bible says, Jesus says, he will contend with those who contend with his people. But he's telling us our assignments. Love, love, love. Love. Be kind. Be good. Operate out of joy. Forgive people. That don't mean that you don't get angry. The Bible says, be angry, but sin not. Don't sin. See, every, everything he said, take those things into your, your bosom and hold them close to you. Jesus Know, knew what he was saying to us. He know we're just flesh, but he also know that with his spirit, you have what it takes 
because you have a restrainer in you. You don't have to fool with everybody. Everybody don't have to be your, like I said, your friend. And hey, we're going out to lunch. And you may not have want to sit across the table with them again. But you can't hate them. You can't hate them. And you do need to pray for them. I pray for people, some people, from a distance. We may not ever sit across the table from each other again. I forgave them. But we're not going to sit across the table anymore. I'm okay with that too. And I'm sure they are as well. I'm not going to waste my time, my energy, disliking anybody to the point that it falls into that category called hate. No, forgive them and leave them alone. Pray for them. The Bible says pray for your enemies. Do good to them. So you pray for them. I'm not going to fight anybody. You don't need to either. But, but it says right here, and I just love this. He says in verse... Um, where am I? In verse 20. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. That was John. He always, you know, called himself that. John wrote this book. You know, he was really up in this thing with Jesus. Following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? What about him? You're always talking about how much he loved you. How much you love by him? What about him? And then Jesus said, if I, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. See, it boils down to, it don't matter what the next person do. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said, really nice. That's none of your business. That's my business. You just follow me. I'm telling you right now today, beloved people of God, it don't matter what somebody else do. Don't let anybody hang you up in a place of jealousy and envy. It does not matter what anybody else do. Jesus is big enough to love all of us. We serve a big, mighty, and powerful God. What does it matter to you what happens to them? You follow Jesus, just like I will follow Jesus. Hope you're blessed by this message. Hope you enjoy the day with knowing that Jesus got up so that you can get up and go up. Amen? God bless you. Be exceedingly blessed. Amen.